Hassan remained calm as the judge read the sentence, death by execution. Josue Flores was murdered last Tuesday on his way home from school. The men confessed to shooting the team execution style. There was some uh, satanic type activity taking place. Officers tell us Trujillo stabbed her boyfriend with stiletto heel shoes. Two-year-old Riley Ann Sawyer's brutal killing shocked the nation. She was beaten to death, stuffed in a plastic box found by a fisherman in Galveston Bay. Former NFL player Antonio Armstrong Sr. and his wife, Dawn Armstrong, were murdered. We, the jury, find the defendant, Antonio Armstrong Jr., guilty. One by one, they described the deaths of the alleged other eight victims of the convicted rail car killer. Probably one of the most cold-blooded, diabolical, heinous serial killer ever to live on the face of the earth. I don't know how anybody could hurt, ever hurt a child. An unusual number of children dying and becoming gravely ill during Jones's nursing shifts. I just feel so sad for for all these babies, and and we got five. We had five mothers who understood and knew what happened to their child. But I think we got 55, 60 that don't. More than a dozen families have now come forward with information about their children's deaths. We deserve to be heard. I mean, our children were murdered, nothing was done. She was implicated in the deaths of 47 little babies. We cannot have someone like that free. Sometimes you think the world's going crazy. My baby girl, Rosemary, never had a chance in life to go to school, to get married, and to have my grandbaby. How many children do you think Janine Jones murdered? More than 60. When you have a parent who's lost a child, you dealt with it every year. It was birthdays, it was Christmas, it was anniversary of death and things like that. And so you really don't ever stop having that void in your family. Kylie Holbrook, um, my sister was Chelsea McClellan, born before me. My mom is Petty Coates Weesey. I said, something's wrong, something's wrong. And she was like, no, she's just mad because she's gotten shot, and she gave her another shot. Chelsea stopped breathing. Doctors in Kerrville resuscitated her and sent Chelsea to a hospital in San Antonio. But in the chaos, Jones slipped into the back of the ambulance and gave Chelsea one last injection. Chelsea died. After it happened, I kept saying, they did something, they did something, but I was the grieving mother. Weesey's intuition was right. Investigators later determined Chelsea had been given injections of a powerful muscle relaxant, enough to sedate six full-grown men. What Weesey did not know was that before Chelsea's death, Jones was already under suspicion. She was always very, I guess, empathetic of the fact that I was always there alongside her and everything, but again, she makes it to where I didn't carry any of those burdens, and I still don't feel like I've carried anything. I just feel like she carried all of them, and then I was there to support her, you know? Um, but we always call it her legacy to see this through, and so that's, I mean, that's why I'm here today. That's why Andy and I have kept a relationship all these years. Andy Kahn, Director of Victim Services, Crime Stoppers. I was, got to know Patty, Chelsea's mom, back when I first started as a victim advocate in the mayor's office in the early 90s, and we were at it, fight, fighting for keep her from getting paroled back in the early 90s, and then of course uh, had to tell uh, Patty that the parole is the least of your problems under, uh, under Texas law. 
she's going to be mandatorily released, no ifs, ands, or buts, unless we can come up with a miracle, and that miracle being another case. I mean, it was crazy back then. So she gets convicted in 1984. Anybody in the state of Texas who was convicted between 1977 and 1987, it didn't matter what you were convicted of. It could be murder, injury to a child, violent, any violent, it didn't matter, any violent offense, you were going to be automatically released as long as you maintained good behavior in prison. And because Jones fell in in that 10-year period gap, she was on the track to be automatically released. So Petty and I would actually go up in person and meet with the parole board as well. And in doing so, again, we attracted a lot of attention by doing that. So we kept the case you know, in the public eye throughout the years. And then we knew we had to take it a step further because 2018 <clears throat> was closely approaching. I get asked all the time, well, why do you keep doing it? For three decades, Petty McClellan Weesey has carried a burden. Why emotionally, why do you keep putting yourself through that? Because I have to. Since 1985, McClellan Weesey has pushed for one thing, and that is for someone to take a closer look at Janine Jones. There's been many times I've kicked, screamed, yelled, begged, pleaded. Those long years of work paid off last month. The fact that they definitely said, you know, this needs to be looked into, this needs to be investigated, it meant everything. Jones was convicted of killing McClellan Weesey's daughter Chelsea in 1985 by giving her an overdose of muscle relaxants. At the time of her conviction, Jones was also suspected of killing dozens of other babies during her time as a pediatric nurse in San Antonio and Kerrville. But since court records showed the now defunct hospital Jones worked for shredded so many of the documents regarding the children's deaths, no prosecution for those cases was pursued. Texas is going to release a serial killer of children. I'd never seen her age so much so fast, but it was not just her carrying her burden, it was her carrying these other moms' burdens because these moms that finally did get called in to San Antonio around the 2013-2015 time period, they were still terrified from the 80s, they were still terrified. And so mom carrying the burden for these moms too, I mean, she grew this, this relationship with them and they leaned on her. So she, I think that in addition to her own battle, she knew this battle was for, was for them. So it, it, was even, it was even scarier to her. It was, it was um, more on her shoulders than I think that she ever imagined. My mom had passed away um, in between all of those things. Um, the the new she 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 died of, of natural causes, but you know the, the stress of all of this was for her last year year and a half. I mean it was it was so much. I remember sitting in Nico's office after we had had a formal meeting with him and, and Jason, and he said that. This is very near and dear to him, and, and he had lost a brother at a young age. And that, to me, was him sharing to say, trust me, this is important to me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry you guys through this. Follow the evidence wherever it leads us, and work diligently to count for every child whose life was stolen at the hands of Jones. Petty was a warrior. You talk about a mommy honoring her tri or child, the treasure of her life. She did it. I mean, she was, I mean, the stamina that woman had, I believe that she's with her baby now. And she was a precious woman, just so gracious, just a woman of incredible integrity and grace. And I, I was just honored to, to know her. People heard about Janine Jones, the baby killer for years. I have said many times, I felt there was a lot of reasons why that season in my life had me lead the DA's office in our community as a district attorney. But if the good Lord put me in office just for the Janine Jones prosecution, it was worth it. She was a skilled nurse, and she used that skill in being able to do those things and in her intelligence that she had. Um, because it, it, you had to be intelligent to know what to do, what medications to give, how to cause babies to go into code blue that hopefully wouldn't kill them, but you know, maybe they die, maybe they don't. Um, 
you have to be intelligent to do that. And she used all of that for, for this weird, whatever gratification she got from hurting these children and trying to save them. Jason Goss, I was the lead prosecutor on the reopening of the Janine Jones case in 2017. From the people that I know that know her, because we interviewed every nurse that worked with her, she was cantankerous, she was difficult, she was hard to work with, um, she was she ran hot and cold, she there was a lot of uh, she was mean, you know um, that's how they described her. When I came back and worked for Nico in the DA's office, I had an investigator that was assigned to my court, a guy named Larry DeHaven. And Larry, um, one time we went to lunch and he said, you know, I'd really like to talk to you about this. I think that there's this case and nobody's really doing anything about it and it's terrible. And I said, okay, well, you know, yeah, what's, what kind of case is it? And he told me, and you know, and I'm not from San Antonio originally, so I wasn't, and honestly, and I was born at the same time these babies were born. I'm the same age as almost all these victims. And so I had never heard of it and I was shocked. Dr. Kathleen Holland had seven infants who stopped breathing and had seizures severe enough to require emergency resuscitation in her office. And then uh, my wife and I were watching Forensic Files and the Forensic Files episode came on about Janine Jones. And so as we're watching it, my wife, who's also a prosecutor, she said, you know, that's in San Antonio. I mean, you can do something. Like, you can do something about that, because on the Forensic Files episode, I think at the end it said something like, um, she's going to be released in 2018. And so she said, look, you can, you can do something about that. And so I said, all right, all right, I will. I said, but I, I need a commitment from you because I'm going to be, you know, it's going to take a lot of work. And she said, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, if you can keep that woman in jail, you need to do it. So that's when I went to Nico and I just said, look, I know that you've got some people that have been working on it, but I'd like to take a stab at it and I'd like to see you know, what I can do with it. And I said, well, I was actually looking for someone for it, and you're perfect, because he's a hell of a trial lawyer and a very good lawyer just in general. There was 56 boxes of, of information that what was reported back to me was ignored. There was other evidence from other cases in certain boxes. It was kind of in the back of the white collar section. The way it was described to me is these, these boxes were not actively being worked. We had to give it CPR. <laughs> they were in dire straits, but they, they were brought back. And, and that, that I really credit Jason and, and, and the team that he was working with, Jay and, and, his, and the people that we assigned there. Just phenomenal work done. Because you're talking about old evidence. They don't have the ways that we preserve evidence now. And then when certain evidence was ignored, I think a lot of people took for granted certain things and evidence wasn't preserved the way it should have been. What was it like when you first got the boxes? Daunting. This case was a special case because a lot of times people understand cases to be started at a police department and then the police department gathers the evidence and then they present it to a DA's office who then presents it to a grand jury. This was a case that was actually investigated in the grand jury stage and so the DA at the time, Sam Millsap, when he opened the investigation, it wasn't with the police department, it was literally um, prosecutors and DA's investigators in the early 80s that were had convened a grand jury and they brought all the witnesses and doctors and nurses into the grand jury. So a lot of those boxes just contained the transcripts of, of the grand jury testimony. When it got to us, we knew that a convicted baby murderer was on the floor doing these things at the time. Because they had already proven she killed Because they had already proven that she killed it. She was serving a life sentence. She was serving a 99 year sentence and a 60 year sentence for doing this exact thing. So the, the, the moment that I knew that we could we could really do it was uh, Dr. Farinacci, who um, is a dentist now um, in shirts, but at the time he was a medical technician and he had a card for Joshua Sawyer that showed that Joshua Sawyer's dilantin level was at a 59.6. And for reference, um, a normal dilantin level would be somewhere between like 11 and 17. Party's ready on the state of Texas versus Janine Jones. In a Bear County courtroom, the woman once dubbed the angel of death finally admitted to murder. Janine Jones pleaded guilty to the 1981 murder of Joshua Sawyer. Her sentence is life in prison. Joshua's mother, Connie Weeks, then spoke. So I will leave you with this. I hope for you to live a long and miserable life behind bars. Goodbye. You took God's most precious gift, babies, defenseless, innocent. One of the things that we had with Joshua Sawyer that we didn't have with the other children was that Joshua's mother, Connie, she ended up getting all of Joshua's medical records back from the lawyer. 
um, and she kept them for all that time. You know, and she told me, she said, you know, I, I would, every year I'd bring them out and look at them and see like if I could see something, you know, to show that this woman did it, you know, and that she would be held accountable for it. But she said, but I didn't because I don't know, you know, these medical records, which of course she doesn't, you know, how, how would she be expected to? But in that, in what she had, it had the nurse assignments, it had the, the, the bedroom, like the bed that he was assigned to. It had all of these things that showed that, that, um, that dilantin overdose could be the only cause. The way that Joshua died and the symptoms that he had as he was dying um, can, is, is, matches up exactly with when somebody injects you with dilantin and pushes it as fast as they can. They push that plunger down as fast as they can because dilantin is supposed to be given over about it like a two minute period where it's slowly, slowly, slowly pushed in. Um, but Joshua and how he died showed that it was not being done that way. It couldn't have been done that way. What were those, uh, what were those symptoms? You don't have to be too graphic, I'm just curious. He, his heart stopped, but before it stopped, it was racing, it was beating irregularly. Um, he was having all these different, um, and then eventually he flatlined. His mother went to the movies because she finally took a break. Um, she'd been sitting by his bed, and she got told in the movies that she had to rush back, and then Joshua was gone. So Janine waited for the mother to leave. Yeah, probably, probably, you know. I mean, that's, she didn't always do that. We had another mother that watched her do it. Right, yeah, but I mean, cause Petty, and I know that was the Kerr County case, but I mean, he did that. Did it in did, front did of Chelsea Petty. Chelsea right in her arms. Yep. All these kids deserve a voice, and they all deserve, their families deserve justice. My mission is for all of us San Antonio moms who didn't get heard 30 years ago to get heard and to keep that monster in prison where she needs to be. To us, it was going to be a routine in and out, and it, it, he never came out of it. The nurse working that day in 1981 was Janine Jones. Rodriguez remembers her giving Feliciano his shot. The reaction? was immediate. Gasping for air and just turning blue. He goes into cardiac arrest right there in the office. Rodriguez knew something was wrong, but she was 15, couldn't read at the time, and was the daughter of migrant farmers. No one paid attention. Okay, how did this happen? Why did it happen? Can someone give me answers? And no one ever did. Years later, Rodriguez found justification for her suspicions. Jones was arrested and charged with killing Chelsea McClellan. She gave the little girl an overdose of muscle relaxants while working as a pediatric nurse in Kerrville. Some of the kids in the pediatric ICU are very sick, you know, and that's kind of how she was able, Janine was able to hide, is because you kind of hide because they're very sick and some of them are going to be expected to not make it. Um, but Rosemary was not one of those kids, and she was put in the pediatric ICU after she had just recovering from this, this surgery. And she started having those symptoms at around the same time on Janine Jones's shift when Janine Jones was, was in there with her. Um, was this also Dilantin? It wasn't Dilantin. So, so, we, so Rosemary was uh, unknown. Like we don't know what, what she did, but we do know that uh, Rosemary's mother, also Rosemary, was in the room. She was 17 years old. She was a custodian at the hospital. I trusted you with my daughter and you would tell me it's gonna be okay, Rosemary. My baby girl, Rosemary, never had a chance in life to go to school, to get married, and to have my grandbaby. I pray to God he never come up to her. No more babies in the world. And she was in the room and watched Janine inject her asked Janine, what, what are you putting, what are you doing? She said, I'm just gonna help her sleep. Rosemary did a code right after that. Um, the, doctor that the doctor that had operated on her was flabbergasted because he said there's, there's no reason, there was, there was no explanation for this child to die. There was no, there, there was no complications, her heart was fine, you know, they, there was no issue with that because um, he went personally down to watch it. So we had Rosemary come testify and the grand jury, I mean, when you hear a mother say that this woman, who is a baby killer, injected your child and immediately the child goes into a code blue and then the child dies, um, that's an eyewitness to a baby killer doing baby killer stuff. There was an actual chart done 
mm -hmm. of the number of children who died on all the other shifts mm -hmm. versus the number of children who died on Janine's shift. Yes, it said that that you 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 could take any other nurse and their chance of having something like this is like 2%. And then you look at her and it's like 70. The CDC did a fantastic report where they looked, and it's not just that. I think the more interesting thing in that report was the code blues. They did code blues by shift for each year. And it, it, looks, like, it looks like a skyscraper next to your house is what it looks like when you look at the graph and you see like where, think about your house or my house or whatever, two stories maybe. Um, and then a skyscraper. I mean, that's the code blues that we're and going the on. And the skyscraper was was the number of code all blues, code blues on, Jones. on her shift. I mean, that's basically what was happening. Is is that um, we had the advantage, right? Of we know that she is a known child killer, that she is a convicted child murderer, and that her mo and the way that she did it was by injecting children with medication that's typically available to in hospitals. Um, and doing it in such a way that will cause a code, a code blue. Code blue is anything that would, is basically life and death. So the baby has stopped breathing, cardiac arrest, anything that requires immediate assistance of the baby will die. She's addicted to that. She's addicted to causing that code blue so that she can do it. It's not that she wanted them dead, it's that she wanted them hurt and then she wanted to save them. And I don't, know what, I don't know what causes a person to do that. How did Jones choose which children she was gonna kill? I think that it was just opportunity. Melissa Luna was in court the day that Jones pleaded guilty in this most recent case. There for not only her mother, but the older brother she never knew. She passed on December 11th, the morning of December 11th. She was pronounced at uh, 5.30 a.m. Melissa Luna never expected to say goodbye to her mother the way that she did. At 64 years old, Juanita Villadiel had a sudden onset of pneumonia. Her body shut down and she died in hospice care just days later. And I held her hand the whole night and um, she, um, I'm sorry. I, I, I just couldn't, I had to hold her hand. You know, I was trying, I had to let her know. That was my way of being able to let her go to say, hey, you're not alone. Luna had been by her mother's side long before she took her last breath. She was her mother's companion in court, helping Villadiel, who spoke mostly Spanish, understand each legal step in the case against her son's accused killer, Janine Jones. This one just, it hurts to see this one. Villadiel's son, Paul, died September 24th, 1981. He was four months old. A baby in a casket for anybody, you know, whatever the cause was, it's, hard, you know, and to know that he was murdered. Paul was born with a deformed skull and had been in the hospital following surgery to correct it. Luna says her mother was told the procedure was a success. She was told to go home the day that he died. She was told, hey, you know, um, everything's okay. He's going to be taken care of, you know, and he'll, he's going to go home. He'll be fine. But hours later, they call her and they're like, hey, you need to come to the hospital. Your son's dead. Luna says her mother never got clear answers after Paul's death or even a chance to talk to a doctor. She was told her son had a heart problem. Decades later, prosecutors would allege Janine Jones injected baby Paul with a powerful drug that killed him. A mother knows, a mother knows. So she just, she knew. She knew that my brother didn't just die. She knew that something had happened to him. You gotta be a sick kid to be in the pediatric ICU, right? Like that's, that's a given. If you're there, you're, you're, you're a sick kid. It's one of the reasons that when she went to Kerrville, that was where she really had a problem because she couldn't hide in plain sight there. Because when you're working at a doctor's clinic, none of those kids are, are sick like that. They're not, that's not a pediatric ICU. And they had in one month, they had seven babies going for breathing problems in Kerrville. And that's what really got those doctors in Kerrville, which is a small community, to say like, whoa, we haven't had seven of these in seven years. And now we got seven in a month coming all out of the same clinic. Um, and that's really what was going on in Kerrville. But while she was here in Bear County before she went to Kerrville, she was able to kind of hide in plain sight because the babies were sick. Um, some of them may have been going to die, but she was able to kind of use her um, access to these medications and, you know, and I guess her desire to, you know, be the hero. And she was able to push that into them and try to get them to come back out of the code blue. 
Paul Villarreal was heparin all day. Like Paul Villarreal was bleeding out of his eyes and it was clear that she, he was getting a massive overdose of heparin and, and Paul Villarreal was happening within a couple of weeks of Rolando Santos. And so what was going on there, you could see that like she had kind of chosen heparin by that point and he was having blood come out of his ears, his nose, his eyes. And you could see that it was a heparin overdose that was happening at the same time as the as the child she was convicted of intentionally overdosing with heparin and thank God Rolando's still alive and he, he made it through but Paul didn't. They found that Janine had been researching articles about how to fill up a needle with it and just jab it into somebody. After the line was taken out of Rolando Santos and he was still having those issues Dr. Dr. Copeland suspected subcutaneous injection which he was right because that's what she was doing. She didn't have her normal way of doing it so then she figured out a new way. The whole reason that, that Rolando is alive is that Dr. Copeland knew that there had to be somebody giving him an overdose of heparin, tried to move him off the floor after he saved him um, because he said, he, I'm, I don't want him on this floor. So they actually put Rolando down in a different floor that Janine couldn't access. He didn't know it was Janine. He knew that something, somebody there was doing something. Doctors at a now shuttered hospital in San Antonio noticed an unusual number of children dying and becoming gravely ill during Jones's nursing shifts. Jones left that hospital and moved to Kerrville. Prosecutors would later argue Jones was suspected of killing somewhere between 11 and more than 40 children. No one will ever know exactly how many children Janine Jones killed. That's because the hospital she worked for here in San Antonio began shredding thousands of pounds of documents just as the investigation into the murders began to take shape. How did the doctors in the pediatric ICU unit not look at this and go, okay, this is not making sense. There is no reason that this child should be going through this at this particular moment, sick or not. Sure, um, the, best, the best thing I can tell you is, is at the time the Bear County Hospital was a teaching hospital. And so most of these doctors were still med medical students or getting, or they were in their first year of their residency. So these were one year doctors. Um, a lot of doctors relied on nurses that seemed to know what they were doing, just like doctors do today. Um, you got a nurse that's been on a floor for 10 years and you got these new doctors that are coming in. Um, so she found the perfect hunting ground for herself. Right. The hospital pretty much knew what was going on by the end. Yes, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that there is no reasonable way to look at it than that the administrators knew what was going on. I mean, I, I've actually seen well, we've had copies of meetings and minutes where they've actually discussed it. But when Janine went to Kerrville, they gave her a good recommendation. Yes. Why? They said she was a great nurse. They said that anybody would be lucky to have her. Even though they knew there was maybe not 100%, but a strong suspicion that she was behind these deaths. Yeah, that's the only reason she went there is because they, they found a way to take her off the floor. Um, and they definitely had already had those meetings about specifically Janine Jones by that point. Yet they still gave her the good recommendation. Yes, they did. I'm the one that put that baby in the back of that hearse. Chelsea's great uncle, James McClellan, was relieved when a jury convicted Jones of his niece's death and sentenced her to 99 years in prison. But after serving barely a third of that sentence, Jones is scheduled for release in February of 2018. Texas is going to release a serial killer of children. Sometimes you think the world's going crazy. Jones was sentenced under an old Texas law meant to alleviate prison overcrowding. That law allowed inmates to accrue so-called good time. For every day a prisoner behaves, they get to knock a day off the end of their sentence. Texas changed this law in the 90s, but the U.S. Supreme Court ruled the state could not apply that change to older cases like Jones's. It's never been over. It has never been over. And now, it's really not going to be over. I went with my mom uh, as support, I, and and we sat in a little victim's room, you know, outside of where the grand jury was being um, discussed the first time with, by Jason and, and that administration. Um, whenever they did decide to uh, indict, what was that like? Mom went in there and shared her, her heart and her story to them and Jason and the proof and everything that they currently had. Um, I mean, it, it didn't take long at all. We were told it could be something agonizingly long, but it didn't. And so, um, and then they came out, it was something like I, I didn't know if this was normal or not, obviously never being part of any of this, but I've heard from so many people, this grand jury came out and just hugged 
on the mom's necks as they exited the room. And I have pictures of it um, on my phone, actually. They just wanted to see these, these moms. They wanted to physically touch them and hug them and say, you know, I'm sorry. And I mean, you just don't hear, you just don't hear about that. What do you think ultimately was the tipping point that she finally said, fine, I'll, I'll plead to this? Um, you know, probably the food at the Bear County Jail. I mean, you know, and really probably the conditions. And, and not that the conditions at the jail are like so terrible, but she got pretty comfortable in the penitentiary. You know, when she comes here, um, she's gonna be in this jail with people who are related to the babies that she killed. And they are gonna be there. They're gonna be, there's a whole community this community ain't like where she went to prison. Like she's in prison and they don't know her from anybody else. But she's in a jail here with a lot of people who are related to or love or knew um, people that she killed and babies that she killed or babies they believe that she killed. Um, and that can't be comfortable. We all believed wholeheartedly that if she got the shot, she'd change her name, she'd be in some vacation Bible school somewhere. Um, some kids, some people that don't even know her, don't have any idea, she'd be volunteering at a daycare, and it would happen again. I mean, I, I don't think that she's ever lost that, that ever lost that desire for the code blue. We got the records of the people in the parole, like the different parole employees that she talked to through the years. And that was one of the things that set us on a journey. Janine had come up for parole. She wasn't ever gonna get it, um, not back then. But, you know, they always ask them, well, you know, I, I mean, are you admitting to what you did? And she did. Um, but then she walked out, she got up and she was walking out of the room. And then she came back and she, she sh opened the door and she shut it and came back and sat down. And I said, I wanna tell you something. And Ms. Ferguson said, you know, yeah, what do you wanna tell me? She said, I really did kill those babies. And Ms. Ferguson said she had the files and you know, and it was Rolando and it was uh, Chelsea. And she had the files, which is what she was convicted of. And she said, no, I'm not talking about those, the other ones. So you had an on the record confession. It, basically we had Marcy Ferguson who was going to testify that that's what Janine Jones told her at the time. So in the end, at least the mothers have that. They do. Even with Janine Jones in, in prison for another 30 or so years, um, it, the piece for my mom was that she was no longer having to, to feel any of that. So it, it, was, it was a big deal for our family too. And, and that's kind of how we went, we got through her passing was knowing that, you know, this no longer was on her. When you look at Chelsea's grave, it forces you to understand there are as many as 60 more just like it, all because of one woman, Janine Jones, and the pain she caused continues to echo throughout Texas. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of The Evidence Room. We're heading back home for our season finale in the case of Baby Grace. That streams next Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. on KPRC2+. For everyone on the KPRC2 Investigates team, I'm Robert Arnold. We'll see you next week.